Welcome to Liquid Margins. This is Social Annotation Strategies for Large Courses. I'm your host, Franny French. Today's guests are Melanie Walsh. She's Assistant Teaching Professor in, in the Information School at the University of Washington. And go Huskies. Um, Scott Johnson, Professional Assistant Professor of History and Undergraduate History Program Coordinator at Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi and Kevin Richards, Assistant Professor of Teaching Clinical Outreach Coordinator for the Department of Germanic Languages and Literatures at The Ohio State University. And then our moderator today is Jeremy Dean. He's the VP of Education here at Hypothesis. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it over to Jeremy. Uh, thanks, Franny. Thanks everybody for being here. I'm super excited about this conversation. Uh, best part of my job is talking to instructors and students about social annotation. So this is always a great opportunity to do that. Um, I'm especially excited though, because we have introduced some features and some practices um, that better enable large courses to use um, hypothesis. Um, I think everybody here is, is using hypothesis in Canvas actually, maybe except for you, Scott, are you in Blackboard? All right, so Canvas and Blackboard, but we're here really to talk about hypothesis um, and how it can be used in, in large courses. Um, that's, that's the focus. But I want to start generally um, and just hear a little bit from each of you guys about uh, what you teach and a little bit of your teaching philosophy, um, and then we'll dive into the social annotation of it all. So maybe we can start with you, Melanie. Sure. Um, thanks for inviting me to be here. So I teach data science and data ethics and digital humanities classes at the University of Washington. Um, this quarter, I'm teaching our introduction to data science class for the undergraduate informatics program at the UW. Um, and so we do a lot of technical work with data science, but we also do a lot of readings, which is where I incorporate hypothesis. Um, I'm teaching a, a smaller master's of library science class where I'm also using hypothesis. I now use hypothesis in all my classes because I feel like it's the best way of facilitating discussions about readings that I have ever found. Um, but I've used it in my other classes uh, that I teach as well, including information ethics and, and policy. Um, and I guess a little bit about my teaching philosophy, at least when it comes to data science. Um, the, the main book that we read in the, the data science class is called Data Feminism. And so there's this commitment to engaging with ethical questions and questions about justice and not only to have it be strictly about data science. So doing those readings and having that kind of like, um, you know, engaged discussion with the students and between the students is a big part of my philosophy, I would say. Uh, let's hear from you next, Scott. Hi, uh, thanks also for having me on here. I teach a variety of history courses. Um, I'm trained as a French uh, intellectual historian. Um, and so at least from where I come from in my teaching, I have a big commitment to analyzing, dissecting, understanding texts. Um, and that was one of the big initial draws for hypothesis for me, especially at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, to get students annotating, working through texts uh, from home, socially distanced. Um, but one of the main sorts of courses I teach here at a &M Corpus Christi is a big learning community history course. So a history course paired with writing studies and then seminar. Um, and in my history sections, I have up to 175 students, depending on the semester. And so one strategy I found really helpful for that really large type of class setting is to have all the students do their reading through hypothesis beforehand. And so they, before they get in the room, they've already had discussions with each other, marked up the text. Um, and then when we get into class, we can then break things up in the different interactive activities, sometimes using hypothesis in the classroom and then sometimes doing other things. Kevin. Hi, uh, I'm Kevin. Uh, I uh, I teach in the German department. Uh, so some, and I've kind of become like a specialist for their GE courses uh, and kind of increasing enrollment, moving those onto distance learning sort of styles. Uh, and uh, and so one of the 
main questions there for me was how do you get someone who is taking the course not to feel like they're kind of alone at their kitchen table? Uh, how do you like connect them with others? And so been using quite a few different strategies and technologies to do that. And when uh, Hypothesis then became sort of, it, at least it was a, sort of like an experiment, I think that last semester uh, is offered. Uh, and so uh, I wanted to try that out and it looks it looks like it's done a really good job. So I use it in uh, my fairy tales course. We have about 300 people in that. And then I break those into groups uh, with Canvas. It makes it pretty easy. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so they, they're able to not only like kind of have discussion about the texts, but also they're able to kind of develop their their thesis or like take like use notes from these annotations to develop sort of their papers that kind of come then after after sort of like five weeks, each five week session or five weeks of section. Um, but yeah. Uh, I think that's that, that's sort of like just in general uh, what, what I do. That's great, Kevin. I'm going to keep it with you and, and ask each of you guys to tell us a little bit more. So I the, the reason you were chosen <laughs> to speak today uh, was partially by me combing through the data of our of a current cohort of, of folks using hypothesis and really looking at course size. Um, and what were the largest courses using hypothesis and uh, and being the most productive in that regard. So large courses with lots of annotations, essentially. Um, so what I'd like to do is hear you gesture towards this, Kevin, tell us a little bit about, and you know, Melanie, you complicated by saying you're teaching different courses with hypothesis so that, you know, seminar style course didn't hit my radar, but you know, uh, it's there. Um, tell me about the course that you're using hypothesis with, the topic, um, the size, I think we got that from you, Kevin. Um, but then also a little bit about how you're, you know, integrating hypothesis, specifically what you're asking students to do. So maybe if you pick it up with that last part and then Melanie and, and Scott, we can hear a little background on the course as well. Yeah, I wanted I wanted students to sort of like, you know, re have it replace, not re entirely replace discussion, but add a second sort of aspect, a second sort of area where they could have that kind of engagement with each other. And reading, especially if it's online, can be like another place where they feel isolated. So having social annotation is a, really a great way so they can see like and engage and get different perspectives, connect with each other's and even what each with each other. And even when it was uh, in person, I had the sense in like large lecture halls that the students were only getting the perspectives of those people who were like next to them if I like asked them to do something in class and then readings like completely not. So I think even like if this were in person, uh, I would still continue with the social annotations uh, for the readings. And so what I've done uh, is uh, I made sure because it's a fairy tales course, I thought that that would be sort of the easiest way place to implement it because most of the texts that we use are out of uh, out of copyright so I could pretty much take translations uh, update those translations make sway uh, presentations out of those so it also is a little bit more presentable and broken up uh, for their reading and then uh, going into canvas uh, I would create uh, use the tool um, to create um, create sort of the uh, the assignments and then uh, divide, create discussion groups or reading groups, probably about eight to nine people per group. Uh, and, and then uh, that would just divide those up. Uh, the, very, the very first time I went through and kind of provided sort of a, a model for like what the expectations were for the annotation and provided sort of like an example, uh, and then did that for all the 37, I think 37, 38 groups that there were there. Um, so that's a lot, that's a lot to kind of manage, like all those groups. Uh, so I did that the first time. Uh, it would be nice if there was a way to kind of like, maybe there is, and I haven't like found it, to, to uh, provide one example that goes to all the groups that I have in, the, in those, you know. So that would just save time. And maybe I would do that then for each reading, kind of provide sort of like an example or question or direction. Uh, and so I then, considering like the massive amount <laughs> that would be required to grade something like that a massive amount of time, I would, uh, I set them into like five week blocks. And that's sort of like just how I break up the semester. So then in a distance learning course, it can get kind of tedious, especially in the spring where uh, people start getting like sort of uh, 
exhausted around week 10. Uh, to break those up where we there's sort of like a renewed sort of section that we're doing each five weeks. Uh, so four weeks, they have readings. All the readings are socially annotated. And then the fifth week, they can catch up on any of those readings. So if they missed some of them, they can have like a week where they can go back and like fill in the gaps. And that's also the week where they where I do the grading. And to grade that, I will take from each week just a sample, like a, a random text. Usually it's the text that I think is the most difficult, you know, that maybe like that they need or the most important one. And then I'll see like if, how, they've, how they've annotated on that. And the requirements for me are that they have at least three sentences, questions. They can be questions or responses, but they should be three sentences and they should be a substantial content, not just like, you know, like, hey, this was great. Uh, what color was the hair of that character? You know, it's things that like really get, get more to it. And so that reduces the amount of like time I spend in, in uh, actually like reviewing what they're posting. And so I get sort of a sense for their grade. And then I put that in for the, and I do that. So every five weeks. So I have like sort of like a little break in, uh, in the other, other areas of where my attention would be. But I think that sort of like is a very general sort of outline of how I, how I use it. Um, and it's been encouraging to see like their engagement. Um, and then when people are kind of off, I will like just say, hey, if you go back and redo this, they get the practice of it and then they know like what they what's expected going forward. That's great, Kevin. Um, I love the point about reading can be isolating. I think anybody I've, I've certainly felt that at times and uh, fortunately stuck with it. But I worry sometimes that that's the time when we lose some students um, when a particularly dense or difficult reading is in front of them and they don't have community to support them um, and, and some kind of interaction to help them through that they, they may uh, uh, drop off at that point. So again, just to review um, uh, what the course is you're teaching, your largest course, whichever one, the largest one you use an hypothesis in, um, the topic, the size, and a little bit about how you're using the tool. And I think you got all that, Kevin, I'm, I'm pretty sure. So appreciate it. Um, but let's go to uh, Melanie next and then Scott. Sure, so the, the big class that I'm using hypothesis in this quarter, it's called Foundational Skills for Data Science. There are 200 students who are in it. And in this class, uh, I have each week one reading that the students are required to make two annotations on. Um, similarly, they're required to make a substantive annotation, and this can be a, a comment or a question or a reply to another student's um, comment, which is something that I think the students really enjoy. So I'm really glad to be able to include replies to actually get that kind of dialogue going. That's one of the big motivations for using Hypothesis for me. In the past, when I had done Canvas discussion boards or you know, like used WordPress to have students try to have a discussion in a blog forum, students would just like repeat the same points over and over again after a really complex, dense or interesting reading. And it was really hard to in, like encourage them to engage with specific passages. And that's able to happen much more organically, I feel like in hypothesis um, where like you can really just zoom in on particular passages that you're interested in. So, so yeah, two substantive annotations and I give them like a whole kind of uh, buffet of suggestions about what that might mean. Like you can make a connection to one of our lectures. You can make a connection to another reading. You can bring in your personal experience as long as it's done in such and such ways. So I try to provide some guidelines for, for what's required. Um, and then I, I suppose the way that I use it. Oh, so then for the large lecture courses, what has been essential for me is similarly, um, we have eight different sections that the students are in. They have lab sessions every week. So I organize them into those eight sections that have about 25 students. Um, so the students are only annotating within their section and they can only see the, the annotations from those other students. Um, I'm kind of curious about what it would even be like to have 200 students annotating one reading. I think that I've just assumed that it would be far too chaotic, but I think it could be kind of an interesting exercise in some regards, but um, well, I don't mean if someone else is doing that, I'm very curious to hear if you're doing that. Uh, but yeah, just 25 students uh, a piece for me. And the main way I've been using it is just to, um, I basically review it as I'm preparing for 
the lecture and I can see like, what are the big questions that students have? What are the big areas of confusion? What are students excited about? So it can really help me like have them lead the discussion or like know what's gonna be kind of a, a vibrant discussion. In smaller classes, I'm also able to like note down okay, a student made a comment about this, or I'll remember that a student made a comment about this, and I can like, you know, reference them by name if the discussion is kind of flagging and be like, you know, I remember that you, you know, had something to say about this. Can you elaborate on, on this point that you made? In a larger lecture course, I think that's a little bit more challenging, but I can still kind of sometimes remember specific things that I know students were talking about. And I can say, you know, a lot of you were saying, and I like doing that, um, just being able to say like, I saw a lot of questions about like this. And it is like one way of like acknowledging, like I'm, I'm invested in your conversation too. Um, that does lead to one ongoing question that I have about the way I'm using hypothesis, which is that like, I have wondered to what extent I should try to be replying to their, like actually be textually part of the conversation in the margins, like in a large lecture course, again, that's sort of impossible for me to do, but I've thought about, should I have my TAs for each section kind of jumping in more and say, and like really being active. So anyway, that's an ongoing question. And then in terms of grading, I have the TAs grade the annotations each week based on that kind of substantive um, like annotation rubric. And with Canvas and SpeedGrader, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and I think it goes pretty, pretty quickly for them. Um, so yeah, I think those are the, that's like the main way I'm using it in the data science course. That's great, Melanie. I actually had a couple a follow-up question, a follow-up point before we get to your, uh, to tell us a little more about how you use it, Scott. Um, when you said, should I be part of the conversation, basically, um, that was one of your ongoing questions. Did you mean that sort of pedagogically? Like, should I let this conversation sit and see how they're interacting and not interfere? Um, or is it good for me to be present? Like, just from a, was that more of a pedagogical question? Like, how much should the teacher be part of this discussion? Yeah, I think it's a pedagogical question. And that's big because sometimes, like, I do think it's great that they, because at this point, I don't often actually reply to what they're saying in the margins. I mostly just do it in the classroom or in discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think it's nice to like let them have their own discussion with each other so that I'm not like, you know, um, yeah, sort of disrupting right. that like camaraderie that they're building together. But sometimes um, I want to like affirm or acknowledge that someone's made a sure. really good point or sometimes I see some like a student saying something slightly problematic that I kind of want to like clarify but then I don't I don't want that to be the one time that I'm jumping into the conversation and make it feel like this student is really being called out like sure. in particular um so yeah I guess it's a kind of array of things Right. And, and now I just want to circle back to one thing Kevin said. I mean, it takes all kinds. It takes all kinds kind of situation, right? Different texts, different pedagogical moments where the teacher sh should be present or should be interactive and one where it's nice to, to step away. I think it, it does the, all situations. But Kevin was mentioning maybe pre-populating some texts with comments, um, you know, signposts or something like that or a prompt. Um, that uh, that would help guide students or you know uh, elicit a response from students and so we see that as well we could get into those different approaches and I did by the way Kevin just want to register the feature request embedded in there which is if I've got multiple groups and I want to post such a signpost or question I have to do it n times <laughs> right now with hypothesis and be nice to ship my annotations to all those groups so that was registered just want to make sure you got that <laughs> Um, but there was one other thing you said, uh, Melanie, that I wanted to follow up on. Um, and that was, and uh, forgive me for sort of testing, a market testing, a kind of slogan for you, but one of the th th things I've been thinking about with large courses and hypothesis, and both so far as I'm hearing it, you guys are using it in this way, is does the hypothesis canvas groups or blackboard groups integration um, enable those larger courses in some ways to feel more like a small seminar in the sense that you can sort of, as you described perfectly, Melanie, like with a smaller group, you can call people by name and really, you know, bring them out and honor their, their points of view and, and elicit more, you know, 
depth from their from their ideas. And obviously, the more and more people that are in the room, <laughs> um, the much harder it gets to do that. I mean, do you feel in some way that this tool is making that larger course a little bit more intimate in that sense? I don't mean to, to totally prompt you too much to say yes to my marketing slogan, but uh, let me say one more thing about that, and then we'll turn to Scott. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I think like intimate is a word that was like in my mind before this conversation. And again, like, especially in a data science course, when we have a lot of technical material to cover, but we also really want to like address these more conceptual, theoretical questions, ethical questions, and like give that, you know, uh, it's due. I think that mm. this is one way that we've been able to achieve that to some extent. Um, I do think like another way, I don't know, I, I've just been thinking about how I should probably be incorporating my TAs more into right. my thinking about this and like potentially have them engaging with the smaller sections in the lab sessions. Again, we have a lot of technical material to cover, so that's kind of specific to like my class and how it's a little bit challenging, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I would say intimate for sure. Yeah, and I guess another aspect of that is knowing where the group is at or knowing the different places the group's at. It's much easier with a smaller class. You're like, okay, we're all confused about this concept. Let's zero in. When you have, you know, 300 students, it's hard to know where are people struggling. And maybe that comes a little bit more visible in these, with this tool. All right, Scott, uh, we're wanting to know a little more about your course, the size, and uh, as um, Melanie and Kevin have done a little bit about how you're using hypothesis in that course. Yeah, so my main course uh, this semester, the big one, it has about 120 students and it's modern US history. So from reconstruction to the present and it's framed as a history of the present course. So explicitly ditching a textbook narrative and focusing on big themes like structural racism, role of the United States in the world, identity, inclusion, belonging, immigration, um, and then also uh, changes in economic thinking in the United States. So uh, because of that framework, um, each week they have very specific readings uh, from different experts that I'm able to pull through the university's institutional databases, ebooks, journal articles, that sort of thing. Um, and with hypothesis, I get them to engage with the, those texts ahead of time before the class begins um, in all of the ways that Kevin and Melanie have suggested, substantive annotations, although I've become a little bit more lenient on what counts as substantive. Uh, because I want to get students to think of uh, the text as sort of hypertext. Uh, so I have some students that absolutely love picking out old people, historical figures, and then finding their pictures or finding videos of them. Um, and I'm beginning to count those more and more as substantive in different ways. Uh, a couple of times I have had to email those students and say, you've done this three weeks in a row, maybe try to switch it up a little bit. Um, but I absolutely enjoy that. And especially when I get students to think critically enough where they can generate their own meme on the content, I think that's fascinating, uh, in part because it gets me to engage with what the current memes are uh, and forces me to think differently and get inside my students' heads, um, but also because it shows them processing and trying to interpret the information in creative ways. Um, I, unlike Melanie and Kevin, actually still this semester have stuck with the large group format. And so all 120 students are in the same room discussing with each other. Uh, and when you, at the end of the annotations that week, when you look at the text, it can look like a mess. Um, but I explicitly walk students through how to hide annotations, use the little eyeball feature, if that's like too intimidating or too confusing. Um, how to keep annotations private for themselves in case they want them for their notes. But then because there are so many different seminar sections uh, that have their own community in the learning community, I want to use history as a way of bridging those sections together. And so to think of them cross section, cross study group as a, as a big um, point of discussion. That said, I think in coming semesters, I will probably play with the small group feature just to see how it works to compare it. Um, but as of right now, up to this point, I have sort of um, been happy in the chaos. And I think the students are happy to see what people in other sections are thinking and talking about with the text. Um, happy in the chaos, I love that. 
<laughs> yeah. But it is, I'm really glad you brought this up, Scott, because it, you know, I, I did notice this in the data, right? And that's part of why I was really glad that you responded is that Melanie and Kevin are leveraging our small group functionality in Canvas, which also exists in Blackboard. So they can break up these larger courses, both of them into you know eight or nine groups for those 300, 200 person courses. And then they really do end up roughly the size of like a seminar, but you're you're doing what Melanie was wondering about, like these texts, I've got 120 students. Um, you're happy in the chaos. And I think you point out one of the really great reasons, uh, Melanie, if you were wondering why sometimes is that, um, you know, connectivity across section, right? When you have all those, I mean, that's, it can get messy. And I think it's so interesting that you teach people to navigate the mess and the chaos, Scott, but there's opportunities for connections. Um, and more generative, more generation of ideas when the more people are there, as long as you can can navigate it. Um, I think that's a super interesting contrast here, but I'll, I'll be interested to see what it's like when you uh, try the Blackboard groups functionality, which we also have. And of course you could go back and forth between having, well, this text, we're gonna do it all together. Um, and this text, we're gonna do it um, in groups. And in fact, you could do some texts both ways. Right, you could sort of like let's all dive into this as a course, and then maybe break up into sections to read it differently, or read it again, or show what we got from the chaos. Um, Scott, in the chaos, though, are you happy grading the chaos? Or are you not grading the chaos? <laughs> uh, no, I I am grading the chaos in part because I like using uh, hypothesis in that diagnostic way that Melanie discussed. So seeing what's questions students have before we get into the classroom that week um, to sort of fine tune what we're going to discuss and work on together. Um, and so I, I really want to go through all of those annotations myself. I think it's like any form of grading. It can be rewarding as well as exhausting. Um, and I think I'm just uh, well trained in getting through the exhaustion. Um, but I, I, I do think that um, there are ways that I can improve getting through both the grading as well as um, sorting through everything in those diagnostic ways. This semester, I tried to get my students to use a hashtag. So every time they wanted me mm. to explicitly respond, they had a pressing question. Um, I wanted them to either hashtag professor or professor reply. It didn't really work yet. Uh, so I think I need to be more mindful about getting them to think about that and play around with it. Um, but yeah, I, I partly want to uh, be there grading so that I can see everything explicitly. Course, yeah, it's, it's labor on their part and you want to honor that. Um, really interesting point about the hashtag. And I think Melanie, if you, if you do venture out into the full group, um, you know, using a tag um, can have a number of different benefits, right? You're talking about um, adding questions so that you could search for questions and make sure that any questions that come up are answered by you. But of course, on any reading, there might be sort of different thematic or theoretical approaches that you might want students trying to foreground and they could, you could use, you know, this group is in the 120 students or 200 students is gonna do the feminist approach and this this group is gonna do the Marxist approach or whatever, and you could track that by those, um, by tags, uh, even in a large group. Um, well, I wanna open it up for questions before our, our hard stop at, at, at um, quarter of. Um, so I just wanna give each of you a, a chance to, um, say one, you know, last sort of share of, of the earth thinking about hypothesis and, and your teaching, if there's something that hasn't come up in this conversation that you'd like to share or, um, you know, request of hypothesis since you have our ear and we can be held to it publicly that you've made a feature request <laughs> like Kevin did. Um, you know, last thoughts before we open it up to the, to the, to the large audience that we have here and some questions that are already in the chat. And Kevin, let's start with you just sending not yeah, final just, thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> final thoughts. Kind of like some things that jog my memory too. I thought uh, really I want to just reiterate also something that Melanie had mentioned is that you get like sort of you can take sort of like the temperature of the course through like looking through the annotations. And so we do a live session. It, mostly it's asynchronous, but then there's a live session every week at the end of the week. And so using the annotations, you can really see like what's a, what what could lead the discussion what could be some really good aspects to talk about what's being maybe misunderstood or what can generate more more dialogue and discussion so yeah i just wanted to like yeah yeah i think that's also a very good way of using uh the annotations and what they can offer i did just want to clarify one thing is it correct to say kevin you're fully online with what you're teaching right 
Yeah, so the two courses I teach, I teach a Holocaust and Lit and Film course that's mm. also DL, and then this is a second. And so uh, trying to combine sort of like the opportunity for it to have like those that live sort of synchronous discussion, but also have most of it be asynchronous. Um, uh, that's that's the way that I'm teaching at the moment. And Scott and Melanie, your courses do have a face-to-face -face aspect, or are you also online? Yeah, we're in person. Scott, uh, this semester in person. Um, okay. I did. I get to get ill at one point, so we had to switch online. Sure. And Hypothesis was great for that. So Scott, since you have the mic, uh, final, not fi final-ish thoughts before we open it up to the, to the audience for questions. Any reactions to what your colleagues here have shared or any joggings as, uh, as Kevin mentioned? Um, I think it's great one that three different, um, different types of courses at different institutions with different students and formats are all using it in very similar ways. I think it speaks to the flexibility and adaptability of the tool. Uh, at this point, uh, and I don't want to sound um, uh, like I'm, I'm patting uh, the team's egos too much, uh, but all of the sort of things that I really wished Hypothesis could do when it uh, first emerged a couple of years ago, I think the team has actually been working on uh, with the one, one big request being tagging video. And I know that's sort of the, the next big step, but also, uh, as someone who knows nothing about coding, I can only imagine how difficult it is to actually get working. Thanks. Melanie? Yeah, sort of building on that point, actually, I feel like my final comments are kind of in the vein of uh, like, sort of in the vein of a feature request. But uh, one thing that I thought, so in the data science class, we're mostly just reading uh, chapters from an online a book that has been published online, it's like PDFs or it's um, uh, the chapter online. But in some of my other classes, um, we've been able to have students uh, annotate YouTube videos by having the transcripts next to the YouTube video through the docdrop.org um, link. And we've also had some podcast episodes that have transcripts and that's been really fun to do. So I've started to get excited about maybe in the data science course as well, incorporating other kinds of media um, for students to be able to annotate. And I think another thing I was thinking about is annotating images, which I think has been another feature request. And I've thought about like, you know, it'd be great to have a data visualization that the entire class could annotate specific parts of it and ask questions. So um, I guess, yeah, one thing for me is like continuing to think about how I can get creative with what, how we can use this tool. Cool. Yeah. And I think there's some great ideas here, even though you are using it in similar ways. And I did just want to shout out Scott about that idea of uh, using images and memes and things in vid in, in annotations. Um, I'd love to do for any a session uh, sometime. I don't know how we choose the people for this, but maybe Scott could come in and, and speak to his, you know, every, each one of you said something about substantive, right? I want a substantive response. And I bet if we gathered your definition of that, they'd all be a little different. Uh, Scott was sort of suggesting that he has a, maybe a more expansive one, like it could be a, an image. And I, I, I totally agree with you. And I also agree that like, uh, if you keep just putting the image of the author, like I want a little bit more at some point, but it's not a bad start. So maybe an episode on what is a substantive annotation? Um, and certainly would like to call your definitions uh, here. But uh, Franny, any questions that have come up in the chat that we could foreground here? Uh, yeah, and some of them have been answered. Thank you to the panelists who already answered a couple of the questions. But um, um, Ying Fan um, wants to know what prompts are you using for the data science course for annotation? Yeah, I saw that question in the chat and I really appreciate it because I'm not, to be honest, I'm not really using prompts at this point. I liked the, um, the suggestion about being able to have like a prompt um, populated in each reading. Um, so yeah, in previous courses, sometimes I have had qu specific questions that I wanted students to answer, but the way that I've been using it so far has just been like letting students kind of lead the discussion and find what they're interested in. And um, I, I basically just discovered that I didn't need to be providing prompts because they are able to like really latch on to what what they are interested in. But I do think that it could be it could be um, 
useful to to bring back in to like have a more guided discussion potentially but um no no real prompts at, at this point i think a lot of it is in that how you define substantive you know like i want you to annotate so what does that look like it's not necessarily a specific scavenger hunt it's kind of a methodology right i want you thinking writing reacting to the reading in these types of ways um rather than search for a specific thing or answer a specific question. Um, yeah, that's well put. <laughs> uh, and then um, Manny Fernandez, um, it's not so much a question, I don't think it's just a comment, but um, Manny can let me know if, if I'm reading that wrong, but um, using a tag group A, B, and C, and seeing which group tagged the document the most, participated the most, would be kind of fun for freshman class within the guidelines of course. Um, so I don't know if you wanna roll with that or I'm not sure where the question You're is. All, you all are here because of the voluminous annotation of your courses. So uh, quantity did matter for your <laughs> attendance here, but um, I'm not, you know, uh, do you guys put a number on the annotations when you Somebody said they say three annotations, right? Do you guys put a number on how many and do you ever have groups compete? <laughs> or does it become competitive? Uh, I think what's kind of interesting is when, so I have like a minimum of, there's quite a few readings. They're fairy tales. So there's, we cover quite a few of them in a week. And then there's a one scholarly article that they also uh, have. Um, but what's interesting is like, there's a minimum of one per reading and it should be like three sentences. But hmm. some people go way beyond that. Like they they really use it as a note taking function and then also respond. So, the, you know, in I mean, it's about the third of the class <laughs> that goes beyond. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I find that they, they are just like very much more engaged in, in part because of the annotating feature. Yeah, I require students to make two annotations, but I love when they go beyond that. And I don't think it's competitive. I wouldn't describe it that way. It uh, to me, it seems more like uh, like organic and communal that students just want to say. Oftentimes, it'll be smaller things since they're not required. But like, lol, haha, this makes me think of mm -hmm. something. And it's it's really like feels more like an actual conversation. So, yeah, two required, but I love when they go beyond. I love that, Melon. It, it reminds me of something you said earlier, right? The, the I don't want to take put words in your mouth, but sort of basically that this is a little more organic than the discussion form in terms of generating conversation. I think that's true because of the textual reference that everybody's sort of grounded in, but also just in the way that people are responding to each other. Um, and uh, you said something about there's something about discussion forms that sort of suggests everybody repeats the same thing, <laughs> and maybe just the way that conversation you know literally is sort of tracking from a from a particular piece of text and then in threaded conversations just you can't just repeat <laughs> like there's a, it's going in a direction and you have to follow that direction and continue it or take it in a new direction but you can't just say the same thing um which by the way would happen if somebody in the chat said like can you have everybody hide their annotations first and then mm -hmm. reveal them later it'd be an interesting thing and of course you know then you know kevin wouldn't be able to just you know repeat or crib off of what Scott said. But of course, what you'd end up having is 15 people all being like, this is what's happening here, instead of one person saying this is what's happening here, and this person saying they disagree, and the other person saying I agree with person one, and it turning into an actual discussion of the meaning. Um, Scott, I want to give you a chance to respond. I'm not sure where this question went in terms of volume and rubrics, or <laughs> if you have a, what direction to take it in. I say students need two to three uh annotations and then i give them uh bullet point suggestions um asking a specific sort of question um showing their analysis responding to someone else's question that sort of thing um but i think if i were if i were to ask students with everybody annotating in that big class uh to do more than two or three then i think it might be become unmanageable for me uh and even more chaosy yeah <laughs> and like the other um people on this call, I there are always students who who end up with like 20 or 30 annotations, um, which is great. Uh, but if I I think if I made it a competition in that large format, I think I would probably drown in the deluge of comments. 
There's a good question just to end off here. George asks, you know, how do you deal with the repetition, right? Of people saying the same thing. Are you on the lookout for that or is it organically being avoided? I think, um, I think, or do you have to intervene? Good. Yeah, I think what's kind of interesting is like they often will highlight parts of the text and then comment next to it. So uh, they're not really, uh, unless they're responding to that highlight, um, they're not really repeating sort of the same sort of comment because it's really it's associated with that part of the text. Um, so I, I haven't like encountered that. Um, and that's kind of amazing that I haven't encountered that and it's such a large group. And I think it's because it's tied to specific, uh, you know, mm. sentences in the text with the you highlighting. You can see this real estate is taken and I, I yeah. need to kind of build on that yep. real estate or else claim some new real estate. Um, I know somebody had a hard stop, so I'm just going to cut us off there and let Franny uh, clock us out. I could keep going. This is a, a really <laughs> enjoyable talking to you all. Yeah, it's 945, probably going toward 946 any second now. So um, I just want to thank everyone here. Um, for joining us today. This was such a good discussion. Always just goes by so quickly. So thank you, Melanie, Scott, and Kevin. And thank you to Jeremy Dean, woo, woo, such a good moderator. And Aaron holding down the chat and Nate as well. And Becky was in the chat too, another colleague. So um, there will be a recording of this. Hopefully that'll be available next week. And um, everyone who registered for this will get uh, an email with the uh, recording link. So um, thank you very much for coming to Liquid Margins today. <laughs>